Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are going to listen to a recording made on December 2nd as the Monroe Doctrine turned 200 years old. We were at President James Monroe's former house on the grounds of the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. We were hosted by UVA professor James Cohen and by the Brown Residential College. James Monroe was brought back to life by University of Virginia professor Chip Tucker, who engaged in a conversation with myself, David Swanson, and with Michelle Elner of Code Pink, as with others present. Let's give it a listen. My name is Jim Cohn. I have the, the, the honor, I think, still, despite the complicated, you might say, euphemistically, history of the fifth president of the United States, James Monroe. I have the honor to live here in his former home. I just want to welcome you all to this event. Um, I know that this event and it is it has sort of uh, sibling events uh, around the world, particularly in Latin America. Um, and I want to say right now that the Monroe Hill House, representing Brown Residential College, uh, sends a very uh, um, heartfelt uh, greetings to any and all others around the world that are that are uh, celebrating today. today. I'm going to start by welcoming James Monroe and David Swanson, who's uh, author of The Monroe Doctrine at 200 and What to Replace It With. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. President. <laughs> you may call me Mr. M. <laughs> or just M. <coughs> Congratulations to us all on this happy occasion. We're here to celebrate a wonderful birthday. Mr. Mr. President. The anniversary. Mr. President. Uh, yes, Mr. Swanson. We are here to symbolically bury this doctrine <laughs> in hopes of abandoning the sorts of behaviors that it has led to for the past 200 years. Uh, what, 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 what's wrong with it? Uh, uh, don't you like it? Um, <laughs> Hey, let, let me let me let me read it. To please, you, please, uh, if I may, um, uh, please understand uh, that I shall be reading uh, uh, this so-called doctrine. It, uh, the text I'll be reading was excerpted years later from what was my seventh annual message to the joint houses of Congress, delivered 200 years ago on the 2nd of December, 18 and 23. Other people than I have promoted it into a doctrine, uh, I gather. But for me, it was a policy initiative embedded in a considerably longer set of pronouncements. Uh, don't worry, I'll read you just the gist of it, which asserts, and I quote, as a principle in which the rights and interests of the United States are involved, that the American continents, by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintained, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. <laughs> <laughs> the citizens of the United States cherish sentiments the most friendly in favor of the liberty and happiness of their fellow men on that side of the Atlantic. In the wars of the European powers in matters relating to themselves, we have never taken any part nor does it comport with our policy to do so. It is only when our rights, our rights, are invaded or seriously menaced that we resent injuries or make preparation for our defense. With the movements in this hemisphere, we are of necessity more immediately connected and by causes which must be obvious to all enlightened and impartial observers. The political system of the Allied powers is essentially different in this respect from that of America. This difference proceeds from that which exists in their respective governments, and to the defense of our own, which has been achieved at the loss of so much blood and treasure, and matured by the wisdom of their most enlightened citizens, 
and under which we have enjoyed unexampled felicity, this whole nation is devoted. We owe it, therefore, to candor <coughs> and to the amicable relations existing between the United States and those powers <laughs> to declare that we should consider any attempt on their part to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere are dangerous to our peace and safety. With the existing colonies or dependencies of any European power, we have not interfered and shall not interfere. But with the governments who have declared their independence and maintained it, and whose independence we have on great consideration and on just principles acknowledged, we could not view any interposition for the purpose of oppressing them or controlling in any other manner their destiny by any European power in any other light than as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition towards the United States, unquote. That is what I had to say in 1823. The national outlook of the United States of America was to defend a still young but vigorously growing republic against the despotism of empire on the part of the crowned heads of Europe. Did I fail to make that clear? What part of empire don't you understand? Mm, what part of independent don't you understand, Mr. President? I do not think that this was meant, and it clearly cannot have been understood as a general opposition to imperialism. While the United States was actively engaged in New York State, in Ohio, and all along its frontier in the murderous dispossession of people from their lands, which elsewhere in this same speech you call uninhabited because of what kind of people inhabited them. And you were claiming vast Western territories for the United States. In your speech, you opposed Russian imperialism on the Pacific coast of North America in hopes of allowing future US imperialism there. <laughs> so this was opposition to imperialism by others. And it did something very dangerous and very insidious in claiming that what European governments did in parts of South America, farther away from here than Europe itself, could be a threat to this vague substance called US interests, which would be equated according to you, with the physical safety of the United States. Now that little trick can bestow upon any distant war of greed or weapons profits the title of defensive. And it has done so over and over again for 200 years. Your doctrine does not explicitly threaten war, but the speech from which it is excerpted, like much of your career, Mr. President, promoted militarism heavily. So you can see how people would understand your doctrine and scream out its name when stealing half of Mexico. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> what? <laughs> Let me reiterate you what, I, away, what I meant. I said the United States would stay out of Europe as well as Europe out of the Americas. I said we would support independent nations in the Western Hemisphere fostering emergent republics like our own, not taking them over. Mr. President, I'm not blaming you for creating this genre of doctrines which has blossomed and flourished from the Monroe Doctrine's roots and completely outside the rule of law, enshrining above the Constitution these lawless decrees that have globalized and militarized and applied the Monroe Doctrine to various parts of this world with crusades from anti-communism to exploitation of oil hey, hey. to Communism? <laughs> to, 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 Mr. President, to oversimplify, let me just explain. Communism would mean something like sharing your riches equally with everybody around, including the people you owned as property. And oil is something people have enjoyed burning ever since you all killed off most of the whales, Mr. President. When the Monroe Doctrine turned 100, it was celebrated almost as a holy text by religious and political leaders, perhaps more significant at that time than the Declaration of Independence and your friend and mentor, Mr. Jefferson. But times have changed. Wars have worsened. Acceptance of wars has receded. Alternatives to wars like diplomacy, negotiation, international law, and nonviolent activism have made people look differently at two centuries of endless efforts to impose U.S. power on others through wars, coups, election interference, financial pressures, 
Some of us even look back at your war for independence and find more to be learned from your strikes and boycotts and tea parties and committees of correspondence and all that was done to shift power away from the British prior to resorting to war. Sir, it seems you're expecting me to have been able to predict the future and account for how others would abuse my statements or misapply them in an altered world. You have the advantage of me, enjoying in hindsight an understanding of matters no one in 1823 could have prophesied. So, catch me up. What I miss? Well? What's gone so very badly since my time? What's gone badly? Um, the U.S. forcibly took over most of the middle of North America from Atlantic to Pacific, largely in the name of expanding slavery, a practice much of the world ended without bloodshed, but which the United States fought a civil war over. A civil war? Oh, a, horrible. A, a horrible indeed. Dividing and bloodying this land with the warfare of state against state, leaving three quarters of a million people dead, leaving bitterness that has not ended. Canada and what's left of Mexico and much of the Caribbean have resisted formal acquisition, but the U.S. military has sought to impose its will, installing bases, empowering brutal dictators, training killers, training torturers. Wait, wait, I want to make sure I've got this right. The United States, the United States has expanded manifold and prevailed against its enemies. It has prevented invasion or takeover, even survived this uh, civil war you speak of. And all this the United States has achieved, remaining intact with the same constitution, governed from the same capital city in which my 1823 address was delivered. As during the war we fought in 1812 against European aggression, our flag was still there. Look young man from the future. I'm sorry to appear a bit naive, but what's not to like? Well, we can discuss who started the War of 1812 later. Maybe we can have some discussion of all these topics with these good people, but times have changed, Mr. President. Weapons exist now that cannot be used without risking the elimination of all life on Earth. Uh, the uh, rockets, red glare, the bombs bursting in air, we, that we, kind of we, thing. We still have your lousy war songs, yes, Mr. President, but <laughs> war has been transformed. You can push a button and blow up a house 10,000 miles away without being left carrying around a bullet like yourself. Some call this progress, but numerous times it has almost destroyed us all in a matter of minutes. The impacts of human industries, not least those which are devoted to war making, threaten all life on Earth as it is, and the resources needed to slow that destruction are largely going instead into wars. The U.S. military has killed millions of people in places like the Philippines, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, with little to show for it, other than hardened hearts at home and the hostile resentment of half the globe. People are protesting your doctrine around Latin America this week. Over half the money that the U.S. government decides how to spend each year goes into war preparations. Territory is almost never conquered anymore, as you were worried about 200 years ago. One of the driving forces behind wars is something you barely had in its infancy, the private weapons manufacturing industry. Another is lust for power. Another is hatred and bigotry. A lot of people no longer think that men and women with a certain colored skin should be property. But many do think that those in certain nations should be blown up with bombs that you could hardly be asked to imagine. And you guys, Mr. President, you enshrined the right to militias armed with the sort of weapons that often left both parties to a duel unscathed. And now people believe it is holier than a presidential doctrine to be allowed to use guns that can kill dozens of people in a matter of seconds. Some 3% of what the U.S. government spends on its permanent standing army, thanks in no smart, small part to your support for maintaining a permanent standing army, Mr. President, could end starvation on the planet. But that's not the priority these days. Competing with China and Russia, as in your day with Spain and Russia, is the priority. And we will be lucky if we survive it much longer. So yes, I love your house, but there are some things not to like, sir. I must say, these horrors you enumerate, 
exceed not only the purview of my December 2nd speech, but also its principal intent, which I shudder to think has become perverted in the way you describe. I have a question for the two of you. All right. Was it not the case around the time that the Monroe Doctrine was first enumerated that Europe was not only very powerful, but a little bit drunk with that power. I'm not sure it's ever stopped being the case. <laughs> uh, the, the great, if you will pardon me, the, the, the great military event of my lifetime uh, was not the war of independence in which I sustained the injury to which you kindly referred, um, but the Napoleonic warfare, uh, which, which occupied uh, a decade and a half uh, and left left the first traces of carnage of a kind that permits me to imagine what my assailant uh, was, was describing with this new weaponry of some kind. So drunk on power uh, were the victors. Uh, uh, also, uh, there was a, a terrible sort of uh, uh, the culture of, of victimage from which nation, nations naturally react with a kind of braggadocio which can lead to interventionist uh, activity of the very kind my doctrine was seeking to staunch. Mr. President, we think nonviolent disagreements about policies and history it, it does not constitute assailing someone. Uh, we've tried to become a little less violent and hostile over the past 200 years and to be able to disagree amicably. But in 1823, 200 years ago, your buddy, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, put into US law something called the Doctrine of Discovery, which meant that any European or the United States as the sole proxy European could take any land they wanted, any land they wanted, no matter who was there. Why? Because number one, people like you in your address to Congress 200 years ago today claimed that lands were uninhabited if they weren't inhabited by the right kind of people. Number two, because you and your cabinet, Mr. Quincy Adams and the rest of them, simply assumed that anybody would want to be part of the United States if they had the chance, so they couldn't possibly be forced into it. And number three, because your doctrine was an incredible sales job of advertising anything the United States does as anti-imperialism. We're opposing European empires. How can we possibly be an empire? Well, by acting like an empire, sir, that's how. I must take my stand again in the ignorance of futurity to which my mortal state commits me. To, I must take my stand in intentions and and uh, the, the, the meanings uh, we had in mind, I, Quincy Adams, and others, in articulating the beliefs, which one can see they got called doctrines after a while, uh, that we did. Of course we believed that we had such a good thing in American democracy that any rational beings with an opportunity of installing a similar, a similar government uh, over themselves, by themselves, would wish to follow our suit and be glad of our leadership in this way. You tell me it has not gone always according to plan. But that, sir, was the plan. You're quick to pick up this, this word, democracy. In your day, you used the word republic, and you used that because you were horrified by the idea of everyone having a say and governing themselves. The people you owned as property, the people you looked down on as poor, the people who were female, the people who were recent immigrants to a country made of immigrants. The people who were female? Did you know? Are they, are they a part of your franchise now? Did you know that women can vote? Yeah, this is this is one of those changes, Mr. President. <laughs> uh, and, it, and, it took, <laughs> and it took about half the time between then and now for that to happen. But you did not want democracy. And nobody today in any government on the planet wants democracy. They use this word to act as if they want people to govern themselves, right? But what they want to do is govern representing the rich and the powerful. And that we like to think of as having gotten better between your day and ours because women can vote and people of African ancestry can vote and so forth. It's actually gotten worse. 
the wealth has gotten more concentrated. The power has gotten more concentrated. The open sales of Congress members to the highest bidder has gotten more shameless. So, Mr. President, we don't have a democracy any more than you had a republic, but it is a good idea. <laughs> I can't help but notice that it is a good idea that the Monroe Doctrine has been used to suppress our, our flags are at half mast on the flagpoles around here, Mr. President, not for your doctrine, unfortunately, <laughs> but because we just saw the passing of a gentleman who <laughs> perhaps has four million people's deaths on his hands uh, and who once said of the nation of Chile in South America that it should not be allowed to have a bad government simply because of how its people choose to vote. It was for him to tell them what kind of government. Through violence, because the idea had developed since the creation of the Monroe Doctrine that this was a role that the United States could play and could play for the benefit of the people of South America and could think of itself as philanthropically, paternalistically, violently overthrowing the government of Chile and putting a dictator in place because they knew better. Your followers in the, in the White House knew better. I know something about Chile. Uh, do they still have a lot of silver down there? <laughs> well, not nearly as much as they did, no. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't enslave people to dig it up either anymore. I think, Mr. President, we ought to ask someone to suggest, I'm surprised you haven't asked, what we would replace the Monroe Doctrine with. Um, because I don't want to replace it with a new doctrine created by a handful of us without the public's say so. But I think we need a new vision of how governments ought to behave, how the US government in particular ought to behave, and we ought to. Given all that you've said, I would be happy to second that motion, and I, I wonder if someone has at least a, a draft uh, of, of such, a, such a document that might be circulated. And well, let, me, to let me introduce to... Michelle Elner from Code Pink, who is going to fulfill that purpose. How do you do? Okay. You are perhaps one of these voters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before I, I read the replacement, I just wanted to say that we are here. Um, not just to witness the burial of the Monroe Doctrine, a doctrine that has, as we heard from, from David, heard, uh, served as, as a pretext for military invasions, dictatorships, um, economic uh, warfare and blackmail, um, you know, the support for coups in Latin America and the Caribbean, among other horrors, but also to uplift these struggles of the people of Latin America and the Caribbean uh, in their struggle to build a more just and multipolar world. The question we must ask in an anniversary like this is why does the US continue to insist in a 200 year doctrine that undermines the aspirations of the people of Latin America and the Caribbean? Why does the US government continue to promote violence, human rights violations, and undemocratic government that we wouldn't tolerate in our soil, right, in the US. Why not turn instead in a, to a policy of mutual cooperation, um, respect for the people of Latin America? Um, why not convince instead of coerce what, that's what we're doing right now, by the way. Um, why not collaborate rather than take advantage? Uh, why do not? Why don't we understand that the instability and violence and exploitation that we promote in our region backfires and leads to migration challenges that we're facing today? Migration, yes, write it down. <laughs> this legacy of intervention, manipulation, and arrogance must. And so let's replace this anachronic, anachronic doctrine by the peoples of the Americas doctrine. Um, a new doctrine that rests with three fundamental principles. Non-intervention, whether it is domestic policies, elections, 
applying sanctions or, or military intervention. Second, respect their differences. Countries in the hemisphere have different religion, have ethnicities, languages, political systems that we must respect and why not learn from them? And third, working together for the common good, whether it's fa fair trade, addressing the climate change, oh, this is something you have to hear about. Or helping migrants in, the, in, the, in this crisis. It's only by working together that we can resolve the problems that we face. So as we lay the moral doctrine to rest, let us embrace a future guided by the principles of peace, cooperation, and respect. Interventionism and the use of criminal sanctions only hurt the people, the, the people's capacity, uh, capabilities of achieving that that we wish for ourselves, which is freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We must be reasonable and coherent if we are to claim that those are our values. We must oppose all forms of intervention, financial sanctions that hinder growth and social policies if we wish to be respected for our freedoms and ideas. We must show that we respect the rights of other nations to decide their own destiny. So I'm gonna read what we think here must be replaced. The occasion is long overdue for asserting as a principle for the future conduct of the United States government that other nations will be treated with respect, that this government will like to be treated with itself. Violations of the rights of one nation by another will be referred by the US government to international courts, with the US government, which the US government will support, join and hold itself likewise accountable to. Such violations will not be used as an excuse for wars by the US military, nor will the US government any longer speak of distance imperial wars as defensive or as US interests as a justification for wars. The US government will cease arming, training, and funding foreign militaries, police, and prison guards, cease sanctioning foreign populations, cease interfering in foreign elections, and cease imposing, imposing conditions on foreign nations through financial, financial and trade policy. The US government will join and support human rights and disarmament treaties, hold other nations to the same standards through its exa example, and non-hypocritical action through a democratized United Nations or replacement therefore. The United States government will remain, will maintain itself as one of, among equals, and as an honest beneficiary of nations less wealthy and of nations that has, have done the same sort of damage to our collective natural environment. U.S. policy will be formed not through extra legal doctrines, but through democratic and representative decision making, respecting all human and environmental rights. Bravo! Bravo! This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way. <laughs>